Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Fatal Five. True Stories. The Story of Nicholas Holbrook. This podcast tells the story of a true tragedy using facts, evidence and information sourced from reports of the South Australia Police, witnesses, friends and members of the victim's family. In this podcast, you will hear the true story of a road crash that took the life of a young man and the long-term devastating effects it has on his family and friends, including the offending driver. It may be distressing or upsetting, and not suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. If you or someone you know has been affected by road trauma directly or indirectly, please contact the Road Trauma Support Team of SA on 1800 069 528. That number again is 1800 069 528 or visit their website at www.roadtraumasupportsa. .com.au for free counselling or support. Go ahead, Corey, you got place emergency? Yes, hello, um, there's a possible fatality in a road accident on West Lakes Boulevard at West Lakes opposite Amy Stadium. Um, there's what appears to be two cars, one's completely totaled, it looks to have gone through a tree. Um, as I drove past, it looked like there was someone in the back seat um, who had uh, passed on. This is the story of Nicholas Michael Holbrook, or Nick as he was known to family and friends. He was only 18 years old when he died. Uh, Henley Night Shift Car, please, an 8201 West Lakes Boulevard, West Lakes, Car V Tree, one appears trapped. Vixen 30. Uh, Vixen 30, just for info, getting a stack of calls about this West Lakes Boulevard 201. One person suggesting that one occupant appears to be deceased. Teenagers in two cars were returning from a takeaway run after 11 last night when the Ford spun out of control along West Lakes Boulevard and slammed into a tree on the median strip. The P-plate driver from Seaton suffered minor injuries. The driver of the second car has also been questioned. Major crash investigators say speed was an issue. On the 11th of June 2009, Nick's mum, Linus, his dad, Michael, and his brother, Sam, had been out to celebrate Linus's mum and dad's 60th wedding anniversary. Nick decided to stay home that night and not celebrate with family as he was busy studying. Nick was also expecting his mate Jeff to come over once he'd finished work so they could catch up with another mate, Philip. The Holbrooks arrived back home at about 8.30pm because Michael had an early start for work the next morning. When they arrived home, Nick was still at the computer studying. They had stopped by a KFC on the way home to pick up some food for Nick. Jeff finished work at Finden Woolworths that evening and arrived at the Holbrooks at about 10pm to pick Nick up. They were just going to go out for a drive, as they often did, and then meet up with Philip when he finished his shift at Hungry Jack's West Lakes. The Holbrooks had no concerns about Nick heading out, as Nick and Jeff often went out visiting friends, and this night seemed no different. Glynis knew Nick wouldn't be late because he had work the next morning. She was expecting Jeff to drop him back home between 11pm and midnight. Nick would often kiss his mum goodbye and Glynis would say, you don't have to do this in front of your mates. He'd reply, I don't mind them seeing me kiss my mum. But this night, he didn't. He just walked out the door, waved and said, catch you later. Glynis didn't know that this would be the last time she saw her son alive. It was about 10.30pm on Thursday the 11th of June 2009. Nick and Jeff left the Holbrooks in Jeff's car and drove to Hungry Jack's, a short 10 minute drive away. When they arrived at Hungry Jack's, Philip was still working and was cleaning up out the back. Even though the store was now closed, Philip's manager let the boys wait inside the store while Philip finished up. (laughs) 
Philip met Nick at school in year eight. They hung out at school a bit, but became good friends after Nick invited Philip to a paintball party Nick had had for his birthday that year. They weren't in the same class at school, but formed part of a larger group of about 10 friends who would all catch up at recess and lunchtime. Out of the group, Philip was closest with Nick and Jeff. When they got together, they enjoyed gaming, going to movies and parties, and just generally hanging out. Philip would go to the occasional party Nick had at his place, or just go around there with Jeff to pick up Nick and go for a drive. Jeff was the first in the group to get his license, so at that point, Jeff would drive and they would go anywhere and everywhere, if they had the petrol money. In 2009, the year after they left school, it became harder and harder to see each other. The three boys were all working part-time jobs with differing hours, and although they would still talk regularly on the phone, the times they were able to catch up became less and less. By the time Nick met up with Philip at Hungry Jack's that night, it had been about three months since they had the chance to catch up and hang out. Once Philip finished work, they all decided to go to Subway to get something to eat from there. It was only a short drive, about seven minutes away. They went out into the car park and Nick naturally started to head towards Jeff's car since they'd arrived together. Because he hadn't seen Nick for a while and wanted to show him his new car, Philip asked Nick to jump into his car with him. Nick thought that was a good idea and jumped in. As it turns out, that was probably the last decision Nick ever made in his life. Philip and Nick were in one car and Jeff was in his. They both drove off and both pulled up alongside each other at a red traffic light just outside Hungry Jack's. Philip took the opportunity to look down and select a song from the CD he had playing. When he looked up, he saw the light had turned green and Jeff had already taken off from the lights and was a long way up the road. Philip decided to accelerate quickly to try to catch up to Jeff. He accelerated rapidly and could see that he was gaining ground. That was until he came to a bend in the road. It had been raining earlier that night and the road was wet, making conditions slippery. Philip had only held his provisional licence for about three months and as such was an inexperienced driver. As he approached the left-hand bend in the road, Philip started to turn, but turned too much. He tried to correct the car by steering in the opposite direction, but overcorrected and went to the right. By this time, Philip had completely lost control of the car and could see he was heading straight for a tree in the centre median strip. Philip didn't know what to do. He froze up and closed his eyes. Nick's parents met in 1981 when Michael Holbrook was 24 years old and when Glynis was 20. Although they were both originally from Adelaide, at the time they met they were working and living in Darwin. He was an assistant manager at Woolworths and she worked in the butcher shop in the same supermarket. Michael was Glynis's boss. They hit it off right from the start and then started meeting socially outside of work. After about three months, they decided to move in together, where they lived happily together for about 18 months, before moving back to Adelaide in 1983. It was another six years before they decided to get married. And they had a lovely reception in Michael's mum's garden in the seaside suburb of Glenelg. The spring day wedding was a beautiful start to their marriage. Michael was 32 and Glynis was 28. The Holbrooks had always hoped to have a family one day, so they were very excited to learn Glynis was expecting soon after they were married. She was 10 weeks into her pregnancy on their first wedding anniversary. Nicholas Michael Holbrook was born on the 28th of August 1990 at the Ashford Hospital. When Nick was about three years old, he was diagnosed as having a genetic disorder called Marfan syndrome. This connective tissue disorder left him with a mild vision impairment and weakened heart and aorta. So Nick wasn't allowed to get involved in contact sport. This resulted in many, many hospital visits for the Holbrooks, and they had to carefully monitor what activities he could participate in. Nick's little brother Sam was born the following year. Michael can remember the day they brought Sam home from the hospital. Four-year-old Nick loved holding Sam, and Michael could see an instant connection. 
like Nick was thinking, wow, I've got a baby brother. Nick was a very caring and compassionate kid, and to his dad it was obvious right then and there, even at such a young age. The young boys were close growing up. Nick really doted on Sam, and Sam looked up to Nick. They were into wrestling and would watch wrestling on TV. In the ad breaks, they'd go into the other room and wrestle each other. Nick's health condition prevented him from playing sports with other kids his age, and it wasn't long before he started developing his creative side and a love for music. As he got older, one of his favourite bands was Nine Inch Nails, and he became a huge fan of Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters. Nick started senior school at Seton High in 2004. When he first started going to high school, Nick wasn't one of the cool kids. At Michael Fields, he was almost certainly subjected to some sort of bullying. Michael remembers that as his years in high school progressed, he really came out of himself, thanks to music and the great group of friends that he made. He became a more confident kid, and the end result was that he had a really good friendship group, and he absolutely loved school in the end. Glynis remembers one girl at Seton High School who was a little bit alternative. She didn't have many friends at school, and every day Nick would come and fight her to make sure she was okay. Glynis was really proud of that. Nick loved hanging out with his friends, a large group who would often come to his place to relax and listen to music. He was often heard playing the drums on his kids set up in the family room. Nick's closest friends were Jeff, Philip and Anne. Michael and Glynis were happy that their son was enjoying himself, safely at home, often with his friends. He just loved music. His drumming teacher said he really enjoyed working with Nick because he was so enthusiastic about his music, and he was really very good. Like many young teens, Nick got a part-time job when he was about 14 years old. He began working at McDonald's and would do shifts after school or on weekends. His work friends often heard Nick singing as he was working and in between taking orders. They would joke that he would get them in trouble because he would get the rest of the crew out the back to sing. At the end of their final year of school, instead of going to the Schoolies Festival at Victor Harbour, Nick, Jeff, Philip and Anne, and about ten others, all planned their own camping trip at Marook in the Ripperland. Jeff and Anne drove their cars and everyone else piled in. For the two or three nights they were there, the group pitched tents and hung out around the campfire, enjoying a few drinks and practical jokes, but generally just enjoying each other's company. They had such a good time, they ended up doing the same thing a few months later at Easter. Since they'd left school the previous year, they didn't see each other as much, and Anne remembers it as a really nice way of bringing everyone together. In March 2009, Nick spoke to Michael and Glynis about a good idea he had to raise money for a good cause. Shave for a cause for the Leukaemia Foundation. Michael and Glynis supported Nick by putting on a barbecue and everyone came over. People could donate money and if they wanted to help chop off a willing participant's hair, they had to donate more money. Three people cut their hair off that day, including Nick, and he raised $400 for the Leukaemia Foundation. Nick's medical condition meant he couldn't drive at night because of his impaired vision, and Glynis initially had concerns about him driving at all, so she would happily either pick him up or drop him off to work or anywhere else he wanted to go. Otherwise, Jeff or Anne would take him. When Nick was 17, he felt he was ready to start to learn to drive for himself. He obtained his learner's permit and began having driving lessons to get his provisional licence. He was really looking forward to being able to drive on his own. He had paid lessons with a driving instructor, but Michael and Glynis would also take him out for driving practice. Glynis found that Nick was very safety conscious and always made sure everyone had their seatbelts on. He told his parents that he wouldn't get into a car with a certain person because he didn't like the way that person drove. Glynis recalls on one occasion, a distant friend from school came around with his car Nick went out to the driveway and was out there talking with him for a while, then came back inside. Glynis asked, I thought you were going to go for a drive. Nick said, I'm not going to get into the car with him, he's an idiot. Glynis thought to herself at the time that she was glad that he had that attitude, and from that perspective, Michael and Glynis always thought Nick was a very responsible person, 
and had no concerns with any of his friends in relation to their driving. Further to that, Nick always had a phone and he knew he could ring his parents anytime to come and pick him up. Usually the person that would most often come around and pick Nick up was his closest mate Jeff. They were thick as thieves and Jeff used to spend a lot of time with the Holbrooks. The next thing Philip knew, he was on the other side of the road, looking at the shattered windscreen of his car. He looked at himself and he felt fine. Then he looked to the side of him, towards where Nick had been sitting in the front passenger seat, and his best mate wasn't there anymore. He didn't know what had happened to him. Philip began hysterically calling out Nick's name. Philip's driver's side door was jammed and he couldn't get out. So he crawled out of the car towards where Nick was sitting and then through an open gap where the front passenger door used to be. He continued calling out Nick's name over and over and over again. I, I couldn't understand why my best mate was not in the seat next to me. And it was at that point that I started panicking and screaming hysterically just his name not screaming because I was freaking well I was freaking out but it was that different type of scream just of uncertainty and I just didn't know what the hell was happening. What Philip didn't know at the time was that the impact of the vehicle colliding with the tree had forced the front passenger seat where Nick had been sitting on top of the rear passenger seat. By this stage, Jeff had turned around in his car and came back to the crash scene. It was Jeff who first saw Nick's hand hanging out the back window. They rushed over and tried to free him, but the door wouldn't open. He was pinned, trapped. They couldn't do anything to help Nick. They heard Nick moan, so they knew he was still alive, barely, but still alive. Being young and hopeful, Philip thought Nick was still going to be okay. Both me and uh, Jeff, after noticing that his arm was out, out of the window, went running to him. And then seeing how he was trapped in pins, uh, I feared for the worst. Um, but then while trying to talk to him, we got a murmur, not, not a word or anything, just an acknowledgement that he could hear us. Um, and that was a little bit of a relief knowing that at that point he was still with us. The triple zero emergency calls came almost immediately, one after the other. A distraught Philip can be heard yelling in the background. Yeah, hello, please. Hello, um, I've just seen a massive crash on West Lakes Boulevard. You've just seen one or you've been involved in one? No, I've just seen one. There's, there's people trapped in the car, we need an ambulance, and we need police and people earlier right now. It's on West Lakes Boulevard, right next to Amy Stadium. West Lakes Boulevard, next to Amy Stadium. Yeah. How many cars? There's one car, it's crashing into a tree. It's smashing to a. It's smashing to. Hey, so we've got an ambulance and the cops coming now, mate. Uh, it's, it's an emergency. There's, there's people stuck and they crashed in, in the actual car. <laughs> how many people still trapped in the car? Yeah, how many in the car? One. Just one. Just one. One's trapped in the car. All right. I'll police and ambulance there as quick as I can. Police and Hello, um, there's a quite serious crash on West Lakes Boulevard just near the entrance to Amy Stadium. They, I think they're going to need um, the fire brigade and they'll definitely need an ambulance as well. Okay, and how many cars involved? Um, it's just one. It looks like the car has veered off the road and hit a tree. Okay, you don't know if anyone's trapped or anything? Uh, it, it, I, we pulled over, I know it would be a fair day, but there was absolutely nothing that I could do. It, it does look like someone's trapped in there. There's been two cars um, travelling at fast speeds on uh, West Lakes Boulevard at West Lakes, and one of them's gone into a tree. 
While Nick was clinging to life, still trapped in the car, police, fire and ambulance were dispatched to the crash immediately. Police patrols and other emergency services arrived minutes later. While paramedics were desperately trying to attend to Nick, police patrols took control of the crash scene. They cordoned off the road to prevent other traffic from entering the area, began speaking to several witnesses and to the driver, Philip. Sergeant Gino Spiniello was one of the first responders to attend the scene. I remember this crash all too well, even 10 years later. It was a cold, wet night and I had only just commenced night shift. I was the first responder on scene. I saw the mangled wreck of a red sedan next to the medium strip. The gravity of the crash became obvious even before getting out of my warm patrol car. I heard screams, but there was also an eerie silence in the air. My immediate concern was towards the welfare of the people involved in the crash. As I walked towards the wreck and into the chaos, my attention was drawn to people standing nearby. They were strangers to me. Some were crying uncontrollably. Others were standing quietly in disbelief, holding one another. Others were screaming with emotion, all looking at me to fix it. When I saw Nicholas trapped in the car, I knew his extraction needed to be immediate. I had no time to be emotionally affected and went into work mode. Police ambos and fireys were encouraging him to stay alive. Nicholas was soon freed and loaded into the ambulance. My hope was one of survival, but my experience knew otherwise. At 9.6 to Com, just to get you informed of the westbound flight, one car, there's one person trapped in there. Um, I've got a male, he said he was a driver. Um, I'm just all watching him at the moment, I'll wait for 390 to come down. Um, no update on the condition of passenger at the moment. It's, uh, just trying to get, get him out there. Yeah, Vixen um, just advising the injured passenger uh, appears to have substantial injury. Uh, he's uh, still alive, unconscious, and uh, I think we're going to need to get a uh, major crash down here. This uh, can appear that uh, they were heading in an easterly direction along West Lakes Boulevard. Uh, so we're going to have to get uh, another patrol uh, to assist with traffic control and uh, cordoning off the scene. Members of the major crash investigation section using the call sign of Traffic 714 were made aware of the collision immediately. Major crash investigation section has the statewide responsibility for the management and investigation of all fatal and serious injury crashes throughout the state. The section contains specially trained police officers who are skilled in processing the crime scenes which assist with determining how a crash has occurred. On the night of the collision, and due to its serious nature, major crash investigators were notified of the collision and the request for assistance was made from the first police at the crash site. 714, uh, we've been monitoring and uh, we'll make our way. Just for info, I understand the driver is out of the car and uninjured, isn't that correct? I can confirm that's the case at this stage. Uh, there's also another vehicle that uh, could possibly have been involved in relation to this, uh, definitely speed being a factor. Uh, we've got the front passenger, uh, just one front passenger that's uh, got substantial injuries at this stage. He's still trapped and uh, being cut out of the vehicle by fiery. Philip received only minor injuries from the crash, a few scratches and minor whiplash, but he was conveyed to hospital to ascertain if there were any internal injuries. He was alcohol and drug tested after the crash and produced a negative result. It took about 27 minutes for the Metropolitan Fire Service to remove Nick from the wrecked car. He was conveyed to the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Roger, we'll see that for your info and comms info, uh, the injured uh, male's been removed from the vehicle and uh, back in the ambo. They're not mobile yet, but they'll be taking him to the RA. While Nick was clinging to life and rushed off to the hospital, 
police patrols at the scene continued speaking to witnesses in order to establish what caused the collision. Paul said he just read his two one down at West Lake, um, speaking to a few bystanders here on the side of the road. Um, they state that they've only uh, heard it, haven't spoke to anybody yet that's actually seen the incident. Um, sounds like it was uh, at least two vehicles uh, drag racing uh, down West Lake Boulevard, uh, travelling east. While police patrols were still not certain how the crash happened at this point, two things were clear. One, speed was a contributing factor to the crash. Two, Nick's injuries were critical and he was fighting for his life. While Nick was being treated in hospital, patrols made the communication centre aware of who he was. Just uh, to give you an update concerning the... Uh the state of the passenger at uh, the IHA. Um, staff just advised me that uh, injuries are serious, uh, certainly are life threatening, and that's the only update they can give at this stage. First name of Nick, surname Holbrook, and he's 18 years old, and uh, update from the airbase is that uh, it's not looking good. Brevet Sergeant Lauren Kearns was the investigator from Major Crash Investigation Section who attended the scene of the crash, along with her partner, Brevet Sergeant Simon Keir. Lauren was at the Major Crash Investigation Section at the time she received the radio tasking. She was completing paperwork from a previous fatal crash. Her roster shift was 6pm to 2.30am. When she arrived at the scene close to midnight, Nick had already been conveyed to the hospital. Lauren's immediate thought was that speed was most likely a factor due to the amount of damage caused to Philip's car and also because the tyre marks arched to the right, signifying to Lauren that the car had lost control and was starting to rotate. Nick's vehicle was towed from the scene at 5.10am and Lauren remained at the scene until approximately 6am. At the Holbrook's house at about 1am on Friday the 12th of June, Michael woke to the sound of the phone ringing. It was the phone call that no parent ever wants to receive. It surprised me that I answered the phone because normally I go to bed um, and fall fast asleep and Gwyneth would wait to that sort of thing but I wait till at this time and, and then we got that phone call somebody we hardly knew. Vaguely knew him as one of Nick's workmates. Mm. That was it. And, mm. um, and he said uh, that Nick had been involved in a car crash. He was in a critical condition and was being wheeled into theatre. Glynis knew it wasn't good. At the time, she worked as a ward clerk at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, the closest major hospital to the scene of the crash. But Michael and Glynis were told Nick was being conveyed to the Royal Adelaide Hospital. From my work at the Royal at the hospital, I knew the fact that he'd gone to Royal Adelaide was meant it wasn't it wasn't good because um, all the serious ones bypass the Queen Lewis and go straight to the Royal Adelaide. So I knew before we got there that things weren't good. When they arrived at the hospital, Michael was clinging to the hope that Nick would still be okay. Then Glynis became confused when she saw Jeff standing in the corridor looking very distressed. She knew Nick had left the house with Jeff and at that moment couldn't understand what had happened. She spoke to Jeff and he said he wasn't in the crash. He told her Nick was in the car with Philip and Philip was now being treated in another area of the hospital. Instead of being taken to see Nick, the Holbrooks were led into a room they call the distressed relatives room. And that's when Michael's heart really sank. He knew things were not good. The doctors and nurses came into the room to meet the Holbrooks. They were still in their scrubs from theatre. The doctors began by listing Nick's injuries and what they did to try to save him. But Glynis intervened and said, he's gone, isn't he? The doctor just nodded. That was the beginning of what Michael describes as our absolute nightmare. 
At 1.19am on Friday the 12th of June 2009, Nicholas Michael Holbrook lost his fight for life. We were just totally dumbstruck, bewildered, in a state of shock. It just it it, it just hits you like it, it's like nothing nothing has ever hit us before. It was you don't you don't collapse into un well we didn't collapse into uncontrollable grief. We were just completely and utterly shocked. Michael remembers thinking, this doesn't happen to us. It happens to other people. The road toll meant absolutely nothing to them. It was just another number in the paper. Michael decided he wanted to go to see Philip, who they knew was being treated in another department in the hospital. Of the moment at first seeing the young man who was responsible for the death of his son, Michael vividly remembers standing at the foot of Philip's bed and thinking, why wasn't it you? How could you do this? He hated him then. Michael then delivered the news to Philip that Nick had died. Philip recalls Michael coming into his room. He was being treated for his minor injuries. I didn't believe it. I was distraught. Once I heard that news, I basically tried getting up out of bed even though I had a collar on at that point to support my neck and I was hysterical. And it wasn't, it was just the fact I didn't want to believe it. So I was trying to get out of bed to go and check to actually see if it was true at that time. Soon after, a nurse asked the Holbrooks if they wanted to go and see Nick. He was in another area, on a hospital gurney, fresh out of theatre. They sat with their son. Michael remembers thinking that he wanted to give Nick a big hug and knows it now sounds silly, but he didn't want to hurt him any more than he had already been hurt. They stayed with Nick for a while, held his hand, and told him that they loved him. Glynis became very conscious of the fact that 14-year-old Sam was home on his own. Before leaving the house to go to the hospital, Glynis had woken Sam and told him that Nick had been in a crash and they were going to the hospital. Being so early in the morning, Sam decided to stay home. Glynis was worried that the police or other friends might arrive at their home to deliver the devastating news, and Glynis did not want Sam to hear it from anyone else. She knew there was nothing more she could do for Nick at the hospital, so she had to go home to be with Sam. When they got home, the Holbrooks had the heartbreaking job of having to tell Sam that his older brother had passed away. They decided to be up front. They woke Sam and told him that Nick had been in a crash and he had died. Telling the rest of the family was painful and distressing. The Holbrooks went to Michael's sister's house at four in the morning. The Holbrooks were still in shock, so his sister rallied around and rang the people that needed to be told. Linus struggled with the prospect of having to tell her mum and dad, who she'd been celebrating with only hours earlier. She was worried the news might kill them. Her brother ended up going around and telling them later that day, because it was just too much for Glynis. Sergeant Spiniello remained at the scene for hours after the crash. I could only hope and pray that the person I had come to know as Nicholas Holbrook would be okay. The sadness set in, as pieces of the events as they had unfolded became known to me. I found out closer to the end of my shift that Nicholas had passed away. I finished my shift at 7.30. I left my uniform and equipment at work, however the feelings and emotions were ones I carried with me. As I lay in my warm bed, in the safety of my own home that day, attempting to sleep, the events of that evening continued to play over and over in my mind. The morning after the crash, Anne tried ringing Jeff, but she couldn't reach him and began ringing everyone else, but no one was answering. 
She eventually heard from one of the girls in the group that Nick had died. She just couldn't believe it. The following morning, Michael was asked to go back to the hospital to do a formal identification of Nick. Michael was supposed to be at work that day, but instead he was in the morgue identifying the body of his 18-year-old son, who was alive and well only the night before. The day before the funeral, there was a formal viewing of Nick at the funeral parlour. Michael, Glynis, Jeff, Philip and other family members attended. They saw Nick for the first time lying in his coffin. The police had previously given Michael some of Nick's possessions, including his glasses. They were a bit bent up and bloodied, but he straightened them up and put them back on Nick. Michael had written a letter to Nick. In that letter, he told Nick what a privilege it was and how proud he was to be his dad and that he was going to miss him forever. Then Michael said goodbye to his son, Nick. I went with Jeff on that day to a little small funeral place to go and view him to see what they had done how like you know, presented Nick um, from after what he was in the crash. But besides that, the only other time I saw him was at the funeral itself. It was obvious how much Nick affected people by how many people showed up for his funeral. It was held in the largest chapel at Centennial Park Cemetery. One of his closest friends, Anne, remembers the chapel was full, with people upstairs, standing along the walls, and with more people outside the door. There were people from school who might have associated with Nick only a few times, and not necessarily called him their friend, but still felt the need to say goodbye. It affected everybody in different ways. Michael and Glynis chose the following Indian poem to feature in Nick's memorial card. This is a special day. It is yours. Yesterday slipped away. It cannot be filled anymore with meaning. About tomorrow, nothing is known. But this day, today is yours. Make use of it. Today, you can make someone happy. Today, you can help another. This day is a special day. It is yours. A picture of a drum kit was featured under the poem. Nick's friends stayed at each other's houses for the week leading up to the funeral. They didn't really talk to their parents because they were still trying to process what had happened. They came together as a group and thought about what they could do to say goodbye. At one point during school, Nick had drawn a picture to say, I love you, with a love heart drawn in the middle. But to the others, the love heart looked like a lemon. So they would joke around saying, I lemon you. For the funeral, the girls made up t-shirts with a photo of Nick on the front and I lemon you on the back. Nick's friends wrote something to say at the funeral about their relationship with him and the funny things Nick had done to try and put a positive light into a horrible day. Nick taught people what true friendship was and he was like a brother to most of us. Nick was always there for everyone. He would support anyone who needed him, just because he saw it as the right thing to do. Whether he needed a shoulder to cry on, or just someone to hang out with on Saturday night, he would be there. You could call him any time, day or night, and ask him to come see you, and he'd always say yes. We talked about, you know, how we met, and things we used to get up to, and... Um, all that sort of stuff, and then um, some of the funny things that Nick used to say. So, because he was obviously um, quite tall, he, his school pants never quite reached down to his ankles where they should. So he um, used to he made up a song about a song about that, which we um, sung at the funeral. But um, he used to call them spants because they were too short to be. Pants and too long to be shorts. 
Anne knew the aftermath of this tragedy was a very difficult time for everybody, but particularly for the Holbrooks. You know, I think that that day and every day since would have been very, very hard for all of them. Um, it's been very hard for all of us as well. Obviously, you know, you move on with your life, but there's still things that remind you and um, days and places that are harder than others as well. Nick's wake was held at the local football club. Members of the bands Nick was involved with gathered together and sang a song that Nick had written. It was the first time his dad had heard it, and that was when, in his own words, he absolutely and completely lost it. And did so for quite a while after that. In the weeks and months after the funeral, the reality really set in. We were still in shock. There's no doubt we were still in shock. Though in the weeks and months after that, that's when reality really sets in, believe me. That was one of the things I noticed. Post the accident was, uh, one of the things you, quite, you, you don't quite appreciate was that, you know, we, we were full of grief, obviously, and losing our son because, you know, we loved him and everything, but, mm. well, I kind of didn't appreciate until later on was that how much it affected all the friendship group because they were just as they loved him just as much in many respects because at that age they're friends of their lives to lose nick it had a massive massive impact on a lot of young people there after the crash sam would spend a lot of time with one of his mates because home was difficult and sad for him and people were crying all the time Glynis remembers the time they went out to dinner at the football club where they held Nick's wake. It was their first time back there since the funeral. And once they got home, Glynis became grief-stricken. In her own words, she had a meltdown, slamming doors and crying about the unfairness of it all. Sam went out into the backyard and covered his ears because he couldn't bear to hear her. When she saw Sam distressed with his hands over his ears... Glynis knew then what she did and how she reacted would affect him, so had to make sure he came out with a positive attitude about what happened. They decided they were going to promote road safety so that Nick's memory stayed alive and hoped that they could save even just one person from a similar fate. Major crash investigators determined that Philip had been travelling in excess of 100 kilometres per hour in a 60 kilometre per hour zone and was charged with the criminal offence of causing death by dangerous driving and was facing a term of imprisonment. His lawyer's advice was to prepare himself for the worst. So in the weeks leading up to sentencing, Philip had begun mentally preparing himself to go to jail. It shocked me. It, don't get me wrong, like, I did caused the death of my best mate, so it's understandable, but the, the thought of getting a maximum of 15 years in prison scared the absolute hell out of me. Although initially hating Philip for what he had done, in the following months after the crash and in the years since, Michael could see Philip's absolute and complete anguish, his total remorse, his begging for forgiveness. He could see that look in his face, that look that he would have to carry the burden of killing his best mate for the rest of his life. So instead of holding on to anger and bitterness towards Philip, the Holbrooks forgave him. Prior to sentencing, the Holbrooks had prepared a victim impact statement which was read to Philip in court. This statement gave the Holbrooks the chance to describe to the court and to Philip how much this crash and the death of their son Nick had impacted their lives. In part, Here's what Glynis read to Philip in court. Philip, I need to take this opportunity to tell you how I feel about what you have done. Your senseless actions on the night of the crash have turned my world upside down and caused me so much pain. Waking up every morning without Nick and knowing that I will never see him again is unbearable. The pain and sadness is relentless. It hurts to see my family in pain, knowing that I can't do anything to make it better. Everything I do is tinged with sadness. 
It breaks my heart to know that Sam is missing Nick so much that he has never been able to talk about his loss. And I worry what effect this will have on him in years to come. He will never get to stand beside his brother as best man at his wedding or at his own wedding. I worry every time Sam leaves the house, fearful that, like Nick, he may never come home. I'm sad that I will never be a grandmother to his next children. He often said he looked forward to becoming a father. Every celebration, every milestone that should have been reached is like a knife through my heart. Instead of being happy when I hear of his friends getting married or engaged or celebrating their birthdays, I just sink deeper into my grief. I don't need to tell you what a great person Nick was and how much he was loved, as he was one of your mates and you also loved him. But on that night, you let him down. Your senseless, selfish actions cost him his life and that is something you will have to live with for the rest of your life. I know that you are not a bad person and I know that guilt and remorse you feel is deep and genuine. I don't wish for you a jail term and I would like the court to know that I have made my peace with you. My wishes for you is that you can find some peace with yourself and do something positive with your life. I need to forgive you, not just for you, but for myself and my family so that we can continue the life that I know Nick would have wished for us. I wish you well. You have a hard road ahead of you to heal and forgive yourself. As the victim impact statements were read, Philip remembers first sobbing, then crying from the dock. He says it's one thing to know what you've done, but to hear down the track how much damage you've actually done is another thing. Even though so much time has passed since the crash, Philip admits that he still carries the guilt, and sometimes he still cries like it happened yesterday. To be completely honest, I don't know how many people would actually survive having this type of guilt on them. The guilt in the past has gotten to me greatly. Um, it's put me in a weakened state of mind, and when I'm in a weakened state of mind, I am... The best way to put it is I just don't care about my own being at that time. So in the, in the early days since my crash, it would be overindulging in alcohol or drugs just to try and take the pain away. And so I'd throw out my own well-being just so I could actually have a moment where I didn't have to feel or remember that, that time that it had happened. However, with the Holbrook support of the decision, Philip avoided a term of imprisonment. He received a three-year good behaviour bond and 10-year loss of licence. To Philip, it was a relief for the court case to be over, but this didn't stop the guilt he has to carry for the rest of his life. It has been 10 years since the crash, since Nick died. The tragic consequences of this crash have affected many people in many ways. At the time of the collision, Philip was 18 years old. He'd just finished school, was still living at home, had a girlfriend, part-time job, great mates and a wonderful future to look forward to. Philip is now 28 and has not driven since that day. The thought of driving absolutely terrifies him. He now has a criminal record and has been rejected from several job opportunities due to the nature of the offence he's been convicted of. He cannot travel to many countries, including the United States, Canada and Singapore and has to wait until 2022 before he can apply for a licence to drive again. He says he won't do that until after talking with the Holbrooks to see how they feel about him driving again. And he still lives with the guilt of killing his best friend. I know he's had to work really, really, really hard on his mental health. Um, and I know every time he talks about it, it it just opens it back up again, and its I don't think it's something that he'll ever get over. Philip has also been actively promoting road safety with the Holbrooks, telling his story to thousands of senior high school students each year, in the hope they won't make a similar fatal mistake like he did. The fact of listening to Michael talk and say his speech makes me really like it was just the other day with my crash 
brings up all the feelings, it puts me in the mindset that night. And then when it's my turn to talk straight after him, I then relive everything. And now, my speeches aren't always the same. And that's because I don't go off of a, like, a piece of paper. It's not written down. It's how I feel when I'm retelling my story. The, the one thing I want the kids to take away from it is to see, because I, I'm a, my, my speech is very emotional based, it's driven, it's raw, it's, I want them to see how it's been this many years since my car crash and I still cry like it had happened yesterday. And I don't want them to feel sorry for me because I've done that. I just want them to see how much damage it still does to me, even though it had been so much time past. And I don't want them to ever be in a situation where they put themselves into it. Because to be completely honest, I don't know how many people would actually survive having this type of guilt on them. It kills people, like it eats them up inside. And I've seen people go crazy over different situations that are similar. Philip decided to get a tattoo as another permanent reminder of this tragedy. The tattoo sits on his chest above his heart and features Nick's name, date of birth, date of death, and the following quote taken from his memorial card. Nick, you taught me what friendship is. Jeff, who was travelling ahead of Philip that night, was also charged with causing death by dangerous driving, and like Philip, if convicted, was facing a term of imprisonment. It was considered that although Jeff wasn't directly involved in the crash, his presence on the road and speed at the time of the collision was enough to hold him accountable for his involvement. Jeff always maintained that they had not been drag racing, and his actions didn't contribute to the crash in any way. The jury agreed, and he was acquitted. Anne is now 28 years old, is married and has a daughter. She often wonders if things would have been different if she was with the boys that night and that she was the driver, as she usually was when they were together. Anne still lives with the sadness of losing one of her closest friends. She remembers that many of the times when they went out, she was the one that would drive, except for that night. This tragedy has definitely changed the way she drives. And she now realises that she had done some risky things when she was younger. She didn't think going a bit over the speed limit was an issue until that night. As a young driver on, on your P's or just getting onto your full licence, you, need, you don't think that that's necessarily, you know, a danger to yourself or to other people. Um, you know, taking that corner a little bit faster than you probably should or, you know, your friend's dared you to go through the roundabout a little bit too fast. Speeding on the way to camping trips out in the country. Um, all of those things which, you know, nothing did happen but it could have. But thinking about those things, that scares me. Sergeant Spiniello has been a police officer for 22 years and has attended hundreds of collisions. To this day, I still have memories of that night. It still saddens me, but I have no choice other than to pick myself up and keep moving forward. After all, I've got a job to do. In her 11 years at Major Crash Investigation Section, Brevet Sergeant Lauren Kearns has attended more than 50 fatal and serious collisions. She has provided support and assistance to countless victims, families and witnesses of road trauma. She has seen firsthand, time and time again, the pain, heartache and immeasurable suffering that results in poor decisions and risk-taking by drivers, and has this message. Think about the possible consequences and, um, and picture the unimaginable grief that family members you know, have to suffer. I only have to see it for a brief moment, um, so I could you know, only imagine um, the heartbreak that it is for those people that have to deal with it for a lifetime. In the years since Nick's tragic collision, Glynis completed a counselling diploma and then at 58 years of age, graduated from Flinders University after having completed a graduate certificate in loss, grief and trauma counselling. 
She became involved with Road Trauma Support Team of South Australia, who provide free counselling and hold support groups with people who have been affected by road trauma. Assistance is not limited to occupants of vehicles or family members, but extends to work colleagues, witnesses, and also to emergency service personnel. See the link in the podcast notes for more information. Glynis is also heavily involved with Compassionate Friends SA, who support grieving parents following the death of a child of any age, no matter the cause. In February after the crash, Michael began speaking about Nick's loss through the Metropolitan Fire Service Road Awareness Program, where he speaks to secondary students and shares Nick's story. Michael has also been a speaker at the RAA Street Smart High Program for the last eight years, where he shares the stage with Philip and presents an emotional account of the events from that night. Moving on 10 years down the track, Michael says occasionally it feels like only 10 minutes. Life is a little more bearable, but family celebrations, Christmas, birthday parties, anniversaries, they're not the same anymore. They're not really celebrations, not without Nick being there. The only anniversary of any real consequence is June the 12th, and that's just a dreadful day. For Glynis, one of the hardest times is New Year's Eve. She feels that because she is going into a new year, she's leaving Nick behind. And with each passing year, she's moving further and further away from her son. Nick always loved New Year's Eve. Nick was the 64th person to die on South Australian roads that year. And tragically, there have been over 1,000 people killed on our roads since that day. These are not just numbers. These are people with families and friends, just like Nick, just like you. People that may have jumped in the car to catch up with friends or to grab something to eat, who are on their way to work or on a short country trip to watch a mate play footy. Everyday events that we take for granted, thinking nothing more than getting to our destination on time. But sometimes, what may seem like the smallest insignificant traffic violation or indiscretion can have devastating consequences. Senior Sergeant Susan O'Connor from Road Safety Section explains what SA police refer to as the Fatal Five. The first factor of the Fatal Five, drink and drug driving. Drink and drug driving are major contributors to the death and serious injury on our roads. Alcohol and drugs reduce your ability to drive safely and with some common effects being slow reaction time, poor judgement, impaired vision and hearing, poor physical coordination and overconfidence. Speeding is the second. The speed of a vehicle affects the risk of a crash happening and the severity of injuries likely to be sustained in a crash. Research shows that even a small change in speed can make a big difference in road trauma. The third is distraction. Driving is a complex task that requires coordination of a wide range of skills. Drivers become distracted when using mobile phones, eating, talking to passengers and using audio equipment. Mobile phones and other personal electronic devices are a major source of distraction. You are four times more likely to be involved in a crash whilst using a mobile phone, even if it's hands-free. The fourth of the fatal five, seat belts. A seat belt is one of the primary safety features of your motor vehicle and if worn correctly, will substantially reduce the risk of a serious injury or death in a crash. In a crash, a person who is not restrained will continue to travel forward at the pre-impact speed until something stops them. This could be a steering wheel, dashboard or windscreen. Number five, dangerous road users. Dangerous road users put everyone at risk and include those people who have a blatant disregard for the road rules. Breaking any road rule can result in a serious crash. A number of these fatal five factors were at play on that day for Nick. At the time of the release of this podcast, June 2019, it is the 10th anniversary of the crash that killed Nick. Michael and Glynis are active in promoting road safety by telling their story, particularly to younger drivers, in an attempt to change their risk-taking behaviours. They realise this crash occurred as a result of what young drivers often do and are determined to change that. At the end of the day, it was... 18 year old kids doing what 18 year old kids do which is what we're trying to change by doing this sort of stuff and they think they're invincible and they've got to learn that they're not. 
18 year olds are prone to error. They make um, impulsive decisions. Philip did, and that was the, the price he's paying, the price he's still paying now is his best mate's death. The chances of being affected by road trauma are very real. South Australia Police ask you to consider the choices you make while travelling on our roads, that you don't take unnecessary risks. Every choice has a consequence. Don't be a statistic. Enough is enough. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.